fields are white and the workers are few, but the Lord of the harvest is faithful and true. Good morning and welcome to my father's place. This is the final chapter of Isaiah, the study of Isaiah called Return to the Lord is finished today at the end of this teaching. And so at the end, I'll speak to that a little bit. But first, I want to pray. And then I want to begin to tell you some of my observations regarding this. And um, as always, I do check with the commentators too. If I were to give this a title, it would be Be Joyful. Be Joyful. All you who love him. So I'll pray and we'll get into it. Oh, Lord. Indeed, we are joyful because we love you. And we pray for all Christians to have that same joy, inexpressible and full of glory, because they are full of your glory, Lord. We pray they would be filled with your glory. We pray that this message would prick hearts and send people to their knees to repent, even your church, just as that was your goal in this passage for your people in the days of Isaiah. Have your way with this, Lord, and Holy Spirit, thank you for opening this to me and teaching me. I pray these things in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. So, be joyful, all you who love him. Isn't that an awesome thing? If you love him, he will make you joyful indeed. Because if you love him, you will obey his commandments to stay and wait until you are clothed with power from on high. Wait for the promise of the Father the Holy Spirit, if you do those things, indeed, you will be joyful. Amen. The Lord says there is great reward for those who love him, who are humble and contrite of spirit and who tremble at his word. But his unrepentant people and the worshipers of the world system that defies God will not rejoice because they will be judged and they will perish. They will be rebuked by the Lord in this passage that they would turn and return to him. For he would do everything that needs to be done in them so they would be obedient and love him even with his own love. So what will happen to those who still refuse after hearing these truths is that he will come in fire and fury to them and he will judge them by fire. Their worm will not die, that is eternal torture, and the fire will never go out, that is eternal flames. In Mark 9.44, 9.46, and 9.48, Jesus Christ uses the very same words to warn his sinning people of that day that they must repent. So if you have been humbled because you have seen the spiritual poverty of your heart and you treat his word with reverence, which is what he means, by humble and contrite of spirit and tremble at his word, if you have been humbled because you have seen your spiritual poverty and you treat his word with reverence, you are supremely blessed, Jesus says in Matthew 5, 3 and 4, for he looks intently with favor to you. And you will inherit the kingdom of heaven, Jesus says. So these are very good things. So in verses 1 and 2, I will read them and then speak. This is a relatively long passage, so I'll read a few verses and then tell you what the Lord has shown me. Isaiah 66, verses 1 and 2. Thus 
says the Lord. Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Where then is a house you could build for me? And where is a place that I may rest? For my hand made all these things. Thus all these things came into being, declares the Lord. But to this one I will look. To him who is humble and contrite of spirit and who trembles at my word. The Lord is far above you and me. If you don't know that by now, you certainly know it by what he says here, because heaven is his throne. (laughs) He is so huge (laughs) that he fills all of heaven. And the earth is his footstool below him. So he dwells in heaven, this endless, eternal place, because he is eternal. So no one can build a natural house for him to hold him. Certainly a measure of his presence filled the temple when Solomon dedicated it. That's very true. But that was not all of God. That was a measure. There is not a building that is large enough to contain him. Hallelujah. And his feet are upon the earth he created. He reminds you that he's creator. Not only is he way beyond and way above us in all ways, but he created the heavens and the earth and the universe itself. It was through him that all things came into existence. He declares. But there is a place, beloved, for we who have seen Jesus come and die and rise and ascend and be glorified and pour out his spirit. There is a place where he will dwell. There is a place where he, the Father and the Son and the Spirit, will permanently and fully indwell. A place where a holy union takes place place because this where is the place that I may rest in verse one is where is my resting place and when I looked it up in Strong's marriage and union are in view the church is the bride to who Jesus Christ okay so there is a place He will indwell you. He will indwell you. You will be united with him in a holy, intimate way. Oh, my goodness. A holy union. This place (laughs) is not made with man's hands. I was not made by man. He's the one who made my life happen in my mother's womb. He formed me. So I wasn't formed with man's hands, but his. He he created me just like he created you. This place, this place of union, of holy intimacy, is the innermost part of those who are humble and contrite and tremble at his word. Treat it with reverence. He and Jesus will permanently and fully indwell you along with the Holy Spirit Because you ask him to do it. You must ask him. But to ask him is to obey and carry out his commandments, as I spoke in the beginning, to stay and wait until it's done. Then you will fully experience him in a union that is holy and intimate. Oh, my. So you contrast that with verses 3 and 4a. But he who kills an ox is like one who slays a man. He who sacrifices a lamb is like one who breaks a dog's neck. He who offers a grain offering is like one who offers swine's blood. He who burns incense like the one who blesses an idol. As they have chosen their own ways and their soul delights in their abominations, 4a, 
So I will choose their punishments and bring on them what they dread. So this wonderful union for those who are humble and contrite and tremble at his word, but for those who defy him, they can make all the offerings according to the law of Moses that they want, killing an ox, sacrificing a lamb, giving a grain offering, burning incense. It means nothing to him because you are rebelling against him. And so he speaks this to his rebellious people. His words sound contrary to the law of Moses, which he gave to Moses. But he's speaking about those people among him who are worshiping false idols, the root of which is the God of self. This applies to the church today because though not many of you have little Buddhas in your house, though some do, he sees the idol of self in your heart. What's in it for me? He sees it. The me gospel, he sees it. He's speaking about those among his people who outwardly perform what he requires. You go to church every Sunday. They do their offerings like they know they're supposed to. But separate from that, rebel against him, following the ways of pagan cults and offering sacrifices to false gods, even offering their own children in their altar fires to such gods who are no gods at all. So if his rebellious people do all the appropriate sacrifices, he sees the evil of their hearts. So to him, they make this sacrifice, killing an ox. He sees them as murderers, sacrificing lambs. He sees them as one who is cruel, that is, who would break a dog's neck for no reason. If they burn incense, he sees them as one who blesses an idol. If they offer a grain offering, it is like swine's blood. It is unclean to him. He sees the evil, the uncleanness of their hearts, despite their outward works. Again, he sees what's in your heart, beloved. As I've said, today's false god is the root of all false gods. It is the God of self. And many infants in Christ, again, the reference is 1 Corinthians 3, 1, follow whoever will tell them what pleases their ears. Many infants follow the ways of the world system that defies God. But he will bring upon them that which they fear as a judgment against them. Unless they repent these infants, unless they repent and ask him to crucify their sin nature, that does away with worship of the God of self and ask him to fill them with his divine nature. Second Peter 1 Peter 1.4 So he, the Lord, knows the heart and examines the mind. Jeremiah 17.10 and nothing is hidden from his eyes. And that's from Hebrews 4.13. If you delight in things that are an abomination to the Lord, according to this word, he would call an abomination. If you do things like that, do not think that you can hide what you are doing or that he has somehow changed his mind. This book is a book of truth. And it's just as true for now as it was in the very earliest days when he first spoke to man. So if you are outwardly doing religious acts, but inwardly are unclean and worshiping the God of self and committing abominations against him, then... He will utterly reject all the outward works, the good things that any kind-hearted person that is not even a believer would do. He will reject all that. He sees your heart. He sees 
that you have chosen your ways and not his. As they have chosen their own ways, the last part of three, and their soul delights in their abominations, so I will choose their punishment, and I will bring on them what they dread. They chose their own ways, so he chooses their punishment. He sees that you delight in, that you take pleasure in abominations. These are filthy things that he detests. So he will force pain upon you. That's what that literally means. Choose their punishments. He will force pain upon you. If you refuse to repent and return to him, he will bring upon you that which you dread. It's just as true now as right here in Isaiah 66. He will even sentence you to eternal torture and eternal flames if you refuse to repent and return to him. Just like Jesus said in the passages I've already spoken at the beginning of this. So in verse 4b, he answers why he will force pain upon you. Why he will judge you. He says, because I called, but no one answered. I spoke, but they did not listen. And they did evil in my sight and chose, chose that in which I do not delight. He sent his prophets again and again to his rebellious people. And he sends ones like me today to his rebellious church, to rebellious infants in Christ who are sin sinning against him. He has sent such ones then and now to warn you of the consequences of your sin, to exhort you to repent. He holds out his hands all day long, offering you repentance, offering to receive you back if you will turn back to him. But like his rebellious people in the days of Isaiah, many of today's infants in Christ have not heeded his warnings. They've continued to do evil in his sight and continued to choose that in which he does not delight, abominations to him, things that are repulsive, things that disgust him. Why do such things disgust him? Because those are the things that draw you after them and away from him. It's a precarious position to be away from the Lord while you still claim him as Savior, beloved. These things turn you to falsehood, including the falsehood, the lie that says God understands you can't help but sin. His son rose, ascended, was glorified and sent his Holy Spirit so your sin nature could be permanently crucified. So there is no excuse for you to remain in sin. All who are in Christ have crucified the sin nature with its lusts and desires, Paul says. All who are in Christ have crucified their sin nature with its lusts and desires. Every single one who is in Christ has done that, Galatians 5.24. So, oh infant, you must repent and ask him to crucify your sin nature or he will force pain upon you and will bring upon you that which you fear. What's the greatest fear of anyone on the earth until they're filled with him? Death. He does not desire that anything should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So repent. If you keep on sinning and refuse to repent, and ask him to change your heart. He promises you and warns you regarding what he will do. And it's because you leave him no other choice. You have chosen what you have chosen. So you will receive the punishment you deserve. So in verses 5 and 6, Hear the word of the Lord, you who tremble at his word. Your brothers who hate you, who exclude you for my name's sake, have said, 
Let the Lord be glorified that we may see your joy, but they will be put to shame. A voice of uproar from the city, a voice from the temple, the voice of the Lord who is rendering recompense to his enemies. So if you tremble at the Lord's word and revere it and love him and obey him, and have carried out his commandments to stay and wait until you're filled with the Holy Spirit, the Lord knows that you will be hated by rebellious believers, beloved. Those who go to church and say they are your brothers and sisters in Christ. And I'm taking this from John Oswald as well as from what I saw. And he's the one from the New International Commentary on the Old Testament who wrote a commentary on Isaiah that is just awesome. Highly respected. He knows that your brothers and sisters in Christ will cast you out from among them, exclude you for my sake, because they will exclude you because of what God has done in you. He knows they will reject you. He knows they will cast you out because you live for the glory of God, not for what God's going to give you. You are permanently filled with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And he is glorified through you, and they are jealous. See John 14, 23 for being filled with the Godhead. You are filled with joy inexpressible and full of glory, as I've already quoted. Therefore, he knows they will mock you, saying, show us your joy now that we are casting you out from among us. Why do they do it? You make them extremely uncomfortable. You make them jealous. Heaven is in your soul, which is a marvelous thing. Why don't they receive it? God's glory shines from you. Don't they see it? Yes, and it drives them crazy. Because he is of what he has done in you, they label you as a fanatic. I've heard that one. Unbalanced. Too heavenly minded to be any earthly good. But heaven is in your soul and your eye is on him continually. That's the heavenly minded that you are. You're not thinking of the day when you're in heaven. Heaven in your soul. Oh, you live to bring many with you when it is time for you to go to him. But for the mockers, they should know that they will be justly punished for their rebellion. The voice of the Lord, last part of six, who is rendering recompense to his enemies. He sees you as an enemy because you mock those who are filled with the spirit. Again, this is John Oswald's interpretation as well. So if you refuse to repent, he will punish you for your rebellion. If you're one who mocks those who are right, full of God, repent now. The Lord will put you to shame. The details of your shaming are in verse 24. We'll get there. And again, he and I don't desire for you to perish. We don't desire that you experience pain at his hand. But if you choose to do it, he will respond in that way to you. Now he goes back to the amazing truth of what happens for those who bear spiritual children. Verses 7 and 8. Before she travailed, that is writhed in pain, she brought forth no pain in childbirth. Before her pain came, she gave birth to a boy. Verse 8. Who has heard such a thing? Who has seen such things? Can a land be born in one day? 
Can a nation be brought forth all at once? As soon as Zion travailed, she also brought forth her sons, her offspring. So it will not be difficult. Again, I apply this not to earthly Jerusalem, also known as Zion, but to heavenly Zion. And the new heavens, the new Jerusalem, the new earth, that's what I apply this to. And to what happens through spirit-filled believers who bear spiritual children, just as I did a few chapters back, especially in Isaiah 49. So it won't be difficult. There will be no pain for spirit-filled believers to give birth to spiritual children. In Jerusalem, natural Jerusalem, or anywhere in the world, I tell you the truth, there will be no travail, no pain. They will effortlessly bear spiritual children and bring forth many offspring. These verses echo the ingathering of the Gentiles, that is, non-Jews, described in Isaiah 49, 20 through 26. Spiritual children you never knew about, both Jew and Gentile, will come seemingly from nowhere, flooding both natural Jerusalem and spiritual Jerusalem. Whoever heard of such a thing? Whoever saw such a thing? A land, a promised land that is not earthly, established in human hearts. A land is born in one day. In a moment of time, suddenly and quickly, you become, your heart becomes a place for God to dwell. My goodness. An entire nation of spiritual children is brought forth all at once, suddenly and quickly. So, after your spiritual children are saved, they will stay and wait and suddenly and quickly be filled with the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Suddenly and quickly, his kingdom will be established in them because Israel was an earthly kingdom where he reigned in a sense and established kings he wanted when the people didn't go off and choose their own. So, Suddenly and quickly, when you are filled with his spirit, his kingdom will be established in you, and you will go to his heavenly kingdom at the proper time. Who ever heard of such a thing? Who ever saw such a thing? You will not only hear and see, but it will happen in you if you carry out his commandments to stay and wait, beloved. I testify of it, that I heard and I saw and I did and he did. Suddenly and quickly. Fill me with his spirit and himself and the son and establish his kingdom within me. Glory to God. Again, the Lord says that just as soon as you begin to give birth to spiritual children, they're brought forth without any pain. Just as you are filled suddenly and quickly, they also will appear suddenly and quickly. Verse 9, shall I bring to the point of birth and not give delivery, says the Lord? Or shall I, who gives delivery, shut the womb, says your God? Oh, he is faithful. He is faithful to deliver. There's no question for those that are humble and contrite and revere his word. They will produce spiritual children because they're filled with him. He will not bring them to the point of birth and then not deliver spiritual children. He does the delivering, and you get a front row seat to watch him do it. <laughs> it's wonderful. And he surely will not make you spiritually barren, like shut the womb. For he is faithful to his word. You will very easily bear children, spiritual ones. Glory to God. So in verses 10 and 11, Another really great promise to those who are humble and contrite and tremble at his word. Be joyful with Jerusalem and rejoice for her. All you who love her, be exceedingly glad with her. All you who mourn over her, that you may nurse and be satisfied with her comforting breasts, that you may suck and be delighted 
for the bountiful bosom. Again, this is a spiritual thing. Be joyful with the heavenly and the earthly Jerusalem, because certainly there, after Acts 2-4, the Jews who were his disciples, Jesus' disciples, certainly, certainly bore spiritual children very quickly after they were filled, quickly and suddenly, just as they were quickly and suddenly filled, filled with the Spirit. And be joyful with natural Jerusalem because of that. Now, natural Jerusalem and all of Israel are far from their God right now. Only one-tenth of one percent of the Jews in Jerusalem have received Jesus Christ as their Messiah. So those who are spirit-filled mourn over her because of that. How long they have rejected. But there will be a day when they repent and believe. Paul says in Romans 11.25. In the book of Acts, all those who were saved and filled were satisfied by and delighted in the spiritual nourishment they received from the Jewish disciples who were filled with the Spirit. After Acts 2.4, from that point on. And today, many are satisfied by and delight in the spiritual nourishment given to them by today's spirit-filled believers and also by the very words of Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Paul, James, and the rest. Nourishment. Glory to God. Verses 12 and 13. For thus says the Lord, Behold, I extend peace to her like a river and the glory of the nations like an overflowing stream. And you will be nursed, you will be carried upon the hip and fondled on the knees as one whom his mother comforts. So I will comfort you and you will be comforted in Jerusalem. Comfort, 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 peace like a river. Uninterrupted, always flowing. Jesus Christ said this in John 14, 27 as a promise to those who stay and wait. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. Divine peace. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. Peace is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. Galatians 5, 22 through 23. Not human peace. Divine peace. So there is no fear when he fills you with his peace. He and the Father and the Spirit fully and permanently indwell you. Am I repeating myself? Yes. So you're filled with his divine peace. The glory, that is the wealth of the nations, will come to you like an overflowing stream. Again, this harkens back to Isaiah 49, 20 through 26, the ingathering of the Gentiles, the nations. The wealth of the nations refers to the spiritual children who will be born from among the nations. That is the non-Jews. Paul went out. Peter went out. Everyone went out with the great gospel of Jesus Christ. And many spiritual children were born suddenly and quickly. Hallelujah. Verse 14, then you will see this and your heart will be glad and your bones will flourish like the new grass. And the hand of the Lord will be made known to his servants, but he will be indignant toward his enemies. To see your spiritual offspring will indeed make your heart glad. It always does for me. I love to see someone's eyes opened and for them to stay and wait. And your bones will be full of life, flourish. Just as new grass is full of life. His hand, that is his complete provision, will be made known to his servants. We're talking spiritual provision here. Those who love and obey him and revere his word are his servants. They will have his complete spiritual provision. But he will make known his indignation. Really, literally, indignation is rage. He will make known his rage to his enemies, his people who rebel against him and the world system that defies God and the worshipers of it. 
They continue to sin, and they have refused to repent, just as you've seen throughout this book. Verses 15 and 16. For behold, the Lord will come in fire, and his chariots like the whirlwind, to render his anger with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. For the Lord will execute judgment by fire and by his sword on all flesh, and those slain by the Lord will be many. What you fear will come upon you. In the context of this passage, fire is his judgment. Fire can be used elsewhere as a symbol of purification. He will send his chariots as an army against those who rebel against him. Even his own people. He declares war against them and the worshipers of the world system that defies him. His chariots will be as a whirlwind, like a tornado tearing them to pieces, as a tornado would do with a human body. Fiercely tearing them to pieces is the meaning of the words here. He will relieve his anger by releasing his fury. He will relieve his anger by releasing his fury. He will rebuke them with flames of fire. He will execute his judgment against them by fire and by his sword on all flesh, and those who he slays will be many. The Apostle John records his vision of Jesus Christ who will judge in that day. Revelation 19, 11 through 13. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and wages war. His eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written on him which no one knows except himself. And as I have taught, he is clothed with a robe dipped in blood, stained with the blood of his enemies upon whom he tramples. And his name is called the word of God, Jesus Christ. Verse 17, those who sanctify and purify themselves to go into the gardens, following one in the center who eats swine's flesh, detestable things and mice will come to an end altogether, will come to an end altogether, declares the Lord. He's saying this very forcefully. Many pagan cult rituals involved in worshiping false gods are illustrated here. The Lord declares that all who worship false gods and perform their rituals will come to an end together when Jesus Christ returns at the day of final judgment. He came to save, but they rebel. So when he comes again, it will not be to save but it will be to judge. He declares it, therefore it will be done. So if you're worshiping the God of self, beloved, repent now. Verses 18 and 19. For I know their works and their thoughts. The time is coming to gather all nations and tongues, and they shall come and see my glory. I will set a sign among them and will send survivors from them to the nations. Tarshish put Lud. Meshach, Tubal, and Javan to the distant coastlands that have neither heard my fame nor seen my glory, and they will declare my glory among the nations. He knows the heart and examines the mind, as I've already said. He knows what they're doing and thinking. The nations that are here, those considered to be unclean by the Jews, will be gathered, and they shall come and see his glory. His glory will be in them, and they shall see his glorious position on the throne. In heaven, they shall come and see my glory. And every knee, even the knees of those who are his enemies, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord at the end of things. Philippians 2.10. But his enemies will be judged and sentenced to hell. They chose to rebel and therefore they chose hell. Then they shall bring all your brethren from all the nations as a grain offering to the Lord on horses, in chariots, in litters, 
on mules and on camels to my holy mountain, Jerusalem, says the Lord. Just as the sons of Israel bring their grain offering and a clean vessel to the house of the Lord, I will also take, I will enfold some of them for priests and for Levites. A day will come when all brothers and sisters in the Lord, including believing Gentiles who love and obey him and revere his word, are humble and contrite. When they all gather to rejoice and worship him forever in heaven, in the heavenly Jerusalem, on his heavenly holy mountain. Again, he has taken and folded to himself some Gentiles for priests and Levites. That would have been an absolute shock to the Jews of this day. Only Jews were to do such things. But he's taking from the nation. And these who were Levites and priests were ones who were dedicated to him, to minister to him continually, just as he dedicated the priests of Zadok in Ezekiel 44, 15 for that purpose. He has taken even such a one as me for that purpose. Verses 22 through 23. For just as the new heavens and the new earth, which I make, will endure before me, declares the Lord, so your offspring and your name will endure. And it shall be from new moon to new moon and from Sabbath to Sabbath, all mankind will come to bow down before me, says the Lord. Again, every knee will bow and every tongue confess, says the Lord. He will make a new heavens and a new earth and he will make them endure forever. Are you looking for an eternal new heavens? And new earth, beloved, what land is your eye fixed on? This or a much greater country, a better country that Abraham fixed his eyes on from Hebrews 11. If you are thinking of a better country like Abraham in Hebrews 11, then you are like Peter and Paul and the rest. Peter says, 2 Peter 3.13, but according to his promise, we are looking for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. In the same way that the new heavens and the new earth will endure before him, you and your spiritual offspring will endure before him forever. And that which you have done in his power as his servant will also endure forever, not natural acts that any unbeliever does if they are kind-hearted, but his work. Amen. New moon to new moon, Sabbath to Sabbath, always and forever, all mankind that dwells in the new heavens and the new earth will come and bow down before him continually. There will be no rebellious ones among them, and they will all humble themselves before him and worship him. Now, verse 24, then they will go forth, these who bow down before him in the new heavens and new earth, then they will go forth and look on the corpses of the men who have transgressed against me, for their worm will not die, and their fire will not be quenched, and they will be an abhorrent to all mankind. His servants will look upon the dead bodies of those who defied him, rebelled against him. They will see, they will be able to see the rebellious in hell, for they will be eternally tortured and eternally burned. And all who are in the new heavens and the new earth will consider the sight to be repulsive, for they refused to repent and chose their end. And that was not at all what any of us wanted. In Mark 9, 43, 9, 46, and 9, 48, Jesus Christ says you must cut off sin from yourself. Pluck out your eye. Cut off your hand. All of those things. Oh, believer, you must do it or meet the same fate. But how do you cut off sin from yourself? I have told you, 
Ask him to crucify your sin nature and fill you with his spirit so you become a partaker of his divine nature. 2 Peter 1, 3 and 4. His divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. Everything has been provided. All you have to do is stay and wait to receive it. Through the true knowledge of him, not outward knowledge, but knowing him intimately. Through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence, for by thee he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises. Oh, take them up. Lay down what you're worshiping now and repent and return. Verse 4, again, his precious and magnificent promises, so that by them you may become partakers. There's no may in the original Greek. You become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. While you are here, while you are here, if you are in Christ, you have done it. Have you done it? He has the answer, so repent and believe and do. Repent and believe and do. He, the warnings of this book, rejoice if you are one who is contrite, if you are one who is humble, if you are one who has seen your spiritual poverty because the Lord has answered your need. You rejoice. The rest of you, repent. Those are your choices. This Bible study of the book of Isaiah has been a wonderful time of learning for me. And I pray it has been for you too. The Holy Spirit has kindly taught me much. And I also have to give kudos to John Oswald, who was very helpful in several sections. I will end this study with some words from him. When I read them, I wept. Here they are. Thus, Isaiah's great book, comes to its end in ways not unlike those with which it began, with a reaffirmation of the great choice that lies before the human race, judgment or hope. But there is one great difference. God the Son has entered into our judgment and has taken it on himself on the cross. And because of that, he can declare that ultimately, listen carefully, he can declare that ultimately nothing can keep us from his love except our own determination to persist in rebellion. Nothing can keep us from his love except our own determination to continue in our rebellion. And that is the truth of it. Amen. Yes, Lord. May many infants in Christ tremble at this word. May many repent, become lowly, contrite, humble, and ask you to do in them what you clearly promise. For surely they will be ones who rejoice at the end of things instead of those who cry in terror. You surely intend for them not to be in that latter position. And so I pray you would do it in your name and in your power. Lord Jesus, amen. The fields are white and the workers are few, but the Lord of the harvest is faithful and true. He'll send forth more workers.